This is Mind Pump. All right, today's episode, we brought back one of our favorite guests, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Now, she is at the forefront of what is called muscle-centric medicine. In other words, we're not over fat, we're under-muscled. In today's episode, we talk all about muscle and how important it is for health, how important it is for your metabolism, and the difference between healthy and unhealthy muscle. Believe it or not, a pound of muscle is not just a pound of muscle. It's uh, it's quite different from one person to the next, depending on their health. She talks about all this and more in today's episode. Now, you can find her on Instagram. Or excuse me. You can go to her website, Dr. Dr. Gabriel Lyon.com. So it's G-A-B-R-I-E-L-L-E-L-Y-O-N.com. She's got great offers on there, but also she's hosting a Forever Strong Summit on January 14th in Austin, Texas. You got to go check that out. All right, guys, uh, new program launch. So I'm going to give one away for free. It's MAPS 40 Plus, brand new MAPS program. Here's how you can enter to win. When we post this video here on YouTube in that first 24 hour period, uh, comment underneath this video. Leave a comment, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, and then we'll let you know if you end up winning and you'll get free access to this brand new program. Now, everyone else, if you're interested, First off, it is not a beginner program. This is a great program for fitness fanatics who are 40 or over. Okay, it's designed with special considerations for the things that challenge those of us in that age group. Brand new program, and if you sign up now, you get $80 off plus two free eBooks. So if you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Dr. Lyon, welcome back to the show. I'm so happy to see you guys. Yeah. Your show always crushes on our <laughs> podcast. People love uh, what you have to say, what you do. We love it. I wanted to get into, I want to start this by talking about sick versus healthy muscle. I Ever since talking to you, I've made posts about this and talked about this. Your example of like the ribeye versus the filet, like that was a great visual. But can we go into more depth? Because lean body mass, we think is lean body mass, right? So bone, organ, muscle, fat mass is fat mass. What's the difference between five pounds of not healthy muscle and five pounds of healthy muscle? It's a great question. But before I answer that, I just wanted to say thank you to you guys mm. because I do not think my book or the platform that I have would be nearly as successful without you guys. Oh, Aww. thank you so much. So thank you that. so much for your support. It when do you start sending the royalties? Did you say? <laughs> <laughs> After I send my five-year-old to your house, I'm not no, have no, no, to your no, house. No, keep that. Um, the question, what is healthy muscle versus unhealthy muscle, yeah. is a very important one. And it's something that is not routinely looked at, which is, when we think about it, it's a huge flaw, right? We look at adipose tissue, we think about adiposity, but we don't think about the health of skeletal muscle. And when I think of healthy skeletal muscle, as I would hope that everybody does, you think about it as a filet. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different because there's something called this athlete's paradox. There's intramuscular fat, which is fat um, after the fascia, around the muscle, between muscle groups. And then there's intra, with an A, intramuscular fat. And that could be what you would say would be healthier fat versus non-healthy fat. So let me explain that. Mm -hmm. So intramuscular fat is something that both obese or individuals that potentially have type 2 diabetes, et cetera, would have. It's fat within the muscle fibers. And the athlete's paradox are is that athletes, a lot of endurance athletes also have intramuscular fat because they use it for energy. Is it for no, okay. readily available fuel? Yes. And is it and did their mm. body adapt that way because of the intense training and right. potential lack yes. of probably yeah. interesting. Yes. Hmm. Probably yes. But the reason I say that is because, you know, when you think about that picture of a fillet, you would imagine that that fillet doesn't have any intramuscular fat. Right. Mm -hmm. Um but the athlete paradox, there is a continuous flux. So it's not fat necessarily that just stays there and builds up over time, but it's it's uh, energy that's utilized. So it's the difference between fat that's sitting there versus fat that's right. being deposited, used, deposited. Yes. You said endurance athletes. Is this not seen in strength athletes? Is it different? From what I've seen in the literature, it's just not as well studied. Okay. So the, we don't know. The majority, and you know, maybe there is um, more and more information, but typically when we think about fat within uh, the intramuscular fat, a lot of it is based on endurance. Okay. And I will also say that when you think about unhealthy fat, this marbled ribeye, is that 
we see that there is an inverse relationship. So you are thinking about two groups of people. So one group is healthy, highly active, insulin sensitive, and they also have fat within their skeletal muscle. And then the other group would be less insulin sensitive, so insulin resistant, more obese, maybe type 2 diabetes, those individuals will have higher amounts of intramuscular fat, mm. and it is inversely related to insulin sensitivity. So for example, your skeletal muscle will be less likely to utilize glucose than another type of mm. healthy tissue. So it's the fat in the muscle in the context of these other exactly. metrics you want to look at that determine... Do they study the fat that's within this muscle to see if there's a different fatty acid uh, composition? If we're dealing with anything like brown fat versus white fat, is there a difference? Another great question. And really the, the person I would point to would be, his name is Brett Goodpasture. Okay. And he is really the guy because there's all different kinds of fatty acids and fats, whether it's uh, ceramides or diacylglycerol, there's yeah. all different kinds. And I think if you were to say what makes a skeletal muscle unhealthy, you would get a million different answers. I so see. I think um, the overarching theme would be, is this muscle uh, static? Are you not utilizing it? it? Is it weak? Right? Is it not strong? And what are the other components that have now infiltrated it? So for example, through advanced aging, we see increase in connective tissue, um, a decrease in ratio of skeletal muscle to fat. We see sarcopenia, obesogenic sarcopenia. So really in the context of the human and the activity of the human and the age. I think this just highlights how complex uh, the human body is, right? You can't just look at one thing and say, well, right. here's what we're, what we're seeing. Do it's we almost like an analogy would be my back is sore. Okay. Do you do anything? No, I do nothing. I sit down all day long versus my back is sore. Well, what do you do? Well, I, I exercise a lot and I run a lot and I do, you know, some hard labor. And so it's a different problem. One would be very bad One, the other one, not necessarily yeah. so bad. Yeah. And I think uh, again, as we progress in this concept of muscle centric medicine, it's going to become more into the forefront of how do we identify healthy skeletal muscle? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the metrics that we look for? How do we look at it as a vital sign? So it's not just the amount, but also the quality, the thickness. And I, I think that that's really where things will advance to. It, um, se it seems like the, the, the move would be to get first get this tested so you have an idea of where your baseline is. And I imagine like many other things, there's going to be a massive wide range and in individual variants to athlete, to person. And so mm -hmm. probably the most important thing would be like, okay, let's figure this out, what my ratios are, where I'm at, and then where I go from there maybe. Yep. Is, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that that's um, the direction that we're going. So when we look mm -hmm. at where we are now, People use DEXA or in body. Mm -hmm. all Do you of have which a preference <laughs> of any of those? I was going to ask you. Um, I'm going to say something cheeky, and okay. then I'm going to say <laughs> what I really think. So I'm going to say neither, mm. because I don't think either are great when it comes to looking at the health of skeletal muscle. And then all the providers and the PhDs are going to go, well, you know, uh, that's stupid because that's what we have. Got it. And mm. I'll say, yeah, you're right. That's totally what we have. In an ideal world, I think we are going to start looking at skeletal muscle directly. The test to do that is called a D3 creatine test mm. because creatine is what is in skeletal muscle. It is not available to the public yet. It's heavily used in research. I would love to see that become available to the provider. And that's not looking at excretion of like through like how the kidneys are filtering nope. it or like current tests. No. And what's the D3, D3 stand for? Is so it's a, a deuterated creatine okay. and it's a tagged creatine. So basically Got they've it. developed this way of being able to identify how much skeletal muscle mass somebody has. So it's just looking at skeletal muscle. It's been validated in uh, babies, you know, adults, older adults. And again, the researchers that did this, his name is William Evans and Hellerstein is the other guy. Um, and that is amazing. If we can begin to use that, I think it could be the same as checking blood pressure. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That powerful. Okay. So when I, back in the day, when I used to think of muscle versus fat, uh, I would think, okay, muscle, it, uh, influences hormones. There's receptors. It puts out certain signals. Fat just sits on your body. That's not necessarily true either. Yeah. Right. Cause fat also has some hormone on its own, has some kind of hormonal influences and so let's, what are the, what are the differences between fat and its influence on your hormones versus muscle and its influences? Yeah, on I, that's a, I, I really like that question. One of the things that I didn't mention about 
intermuscular fat, the fat around um, uh, muscle and fascia, is that the more fat that you have, it does it is inflammatory, right? And it does create cytokines, and those these cytokines create systemic inflammation. That is very well established. Low grade inflammation, that is a problem. The counterbalance to that is healthy skeletal muscle. Contracting healthy skeletal muscle produces counter-regulatory myokines. Wow. And that, I think, really helps buffer. So if an individual, just go with me here. So if an individual is struggling with obesity or an individual is struggling with excesses, excess amount of body fat, contracting skeletal muscle can help balance and buffer that those low levels of inflammation. Even if you haven't completely rid yourself of, say, uh, excess subcutaneous fat. And I think that that's an important point because it's not just about long-term goals. It's about executing in the short term. You know, this makes me, reminds me of, uh, or points to is we've looked at fat now for so long. We now know there's brown fat, there's white fat, there's if if a woman stores body fat around her hips and thighs, there's more omega three fatty acids in there, probably better for the brain of the baby that she may be carrying versus around her belly and visceral body fat, very visceral. bad. Other types of body fat, not as bad. We know very little about muscle. We just know muscle. You I have know. it yeah. or I know. you don't, yeah. and there's no different. Of course, of course, there's a difference between you know healthy versus unhealthy muscle, and then its influence on hormones. Okay, so you said if you got body fat, a lot of it puts out cytokines. Yep. Muscle puts out myokines, which kind of offset that and buffer the inflammatory effect. Okay. So I'm going to paint a scenario to you. Very oversimplified. I know you're a doctor and you're going to hate this, but I'm going to <laughs> put, it, put it to you anyway. Guy comes in, needs to lose 35 pounds, 35 pounds overweight. They want to improve their blood markers. They want to become healthier. Do you make them lose body fat first or do you make them build muscle first? I mean, so 35 pounds overweight, he's going to have much I think the benefits of focusing on skeletal muscle are going to always outweigh the benefits okay. of focusing on um, adipose tissue because when you create healthy muscle, you really improve your metabolism and the efficiency of utilization. Mm -hmm. um, so I would focus on skeletal muscle. Okay. So mm -hmm. adding to that, does that ever change? Thank God, off? that's what we do. I know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we're in alignment. Yeah. Good. Okay, right answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so does that ever, because I feel like that's, we, and we talk about this, that that would be, that's no matter what someone's trying to lose, when they come in, they say, Adam, I'm, I'm 100 pounds, 10 pounds, it doesn't matter. I always focus on building muscle yeah. first, right? And building yeah. the metabolism. Is there ever a case where it's, you wouldn't do that? I think the case where you wouldn't do that is if the proportion of body fat is so high, so high. Yeah. let's say death. it's life emergency. or death, it's an emergency. They have to, it, you know, again, this is just hypothetical. What if they're 600 pounds okay. yeah. and you have to get the you weight off intervene. because they have to go to surgery? Yeah. Then I that would focus sense. on, you know, losing that body fat. That's so and that would be, rare. right. And that would be protein sparing modified fast where okay. that they used to use, um, for situations like that. Yeah, it's an emergency. I see clients like that. I used to manage a gym and we had a, an obesity clinic and people would come in with, you know, and these are gastric bypass candidates and it was emergency like for a lot of these people. Some of them uh, could barely walk into the gym yeah. and it was like, okay, wait, I get some this weight off. But I would always try and get them stronger just because it improved you know, you know, their mobility. You just brought something up. reminds me of an old story. You know, what's crazy is that I actually had people, I had two different people that tried to hire me back in the days to actually put weight on so they could so qualify. qualify. So they could qualify. Yeah, did you know that? Gastric yeah. No. You know yes. that you can be too I, light I to qualify? Ago. Yes. I had the same thing. I got to gain weight right Never now, forget so. that, mm -hmm. that that person sitting down with me. Yeah. And Medical system. Saying, oh yeah, I'm looking to get a gastric bypass, and um, but yeah. I need to I need to add another like 10 pounds of fat. Can mm -hmm. you help me get fatter yeah. so I can get Talk, this gastric bypass? Talking about the, benef like the, the, the health benefits of muscle, one of the more anabolic hormones in the both male and female bodies, testosterone. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there, you know, insulin can be anabolic growth hormone to an extent, um, and you know, the interplay between all the other hormones, but testosterone is pretty anabolic. Like it's pro muscle yeah. tissue in both men and women. Yes. Why is it so demonized? Why are we so afraid of testosterone when somebody has low testosterone to put them? Is it purely because it's a performance enhancing drug or it's been put in that category? Is it dangerous? We got to be careful when we use it because you could overdose on it. Like what's the deal? Let's take a look at where the medical system has been. The medical system in and of itself is not set up for optimization, period, end of story. You broke your leg, let's fix it. You have an infection, let's fix that. Um, you have diabetes, here's some drugs. 
we don't say what what about if you have low muscle mass, unhealthy skeletal muscle mass, what are we going to do to prevent aging? Um, I just think the way in which we have you know intellectualized medicine as a whole is backwards. Mm. Because of that, it's set up where things that would potentially help with longevity and help with aging are thought of as, oh my gosh, how are we, why are we doing that? Mm. And I think that that's the same thing with testosterone. I mean, I've mentioned this before, testosterone is not FDA approved in women. Yeah. How is that possible? Yeah, you guys have it. It's the most, yeah, it's the most abundant hormone that we have. How, how is that possible? Um, I'm hoping that that changes mm -hmm. because we recognize that testosterone, I'm not talking about super physiological levels. Yeah, we're not talking about bodybuilders competing on stage. No, and uh, by the yeah. way, they have they continue to lower the standard of what testosterone is. So if the minimum testosterone a handful of years ago, the the numbers was maybe it's 350. Now it's, you know, it could be 200. Mm. I mean, it's not quite 200, but right. do, you, do you see what I mean? So they keep lowering the standard of what we will tolerate as low. Wow. Now, is this because, because I know for the last, I don't know, five or six decades, I don't know if this is true in women, but we've, I, I know we've seen this in fertility in women, but we've seen testosterone levels dropping in men uh, pretty consistently, probably for the last five or six yeah. decades. Is that why they're changing the standard? Because the average keeps going, I mean, I read, I read a study that showed something like, like a 60 year old man in 1980 has like the testosterone of like a 20 something year old today or it's, something crazy like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that is one reason why they are lowering it mm. because if you lower it, then you're now within normal range. We don't need to treat it. Mm. Maybe it's also because testosterone is cheap. It's not a very expensive <laughs> hormone to That's buy. Funny, yeah. I, um, I, I, I don't know exactly why, but what I can tell you is that patients do much better with more optimal levels of testosterone. And the other aspect of what we're seeing is that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about how it's bad for heart, how it's bad for your heart, how it's bad for the, you know, prostate disease, et cetera. And they're not finding that. Mm. They are finding that it is very protective in many different domains of health and wellness yeah. for an individual. Well, I think it's disingenuous because what we're doing, we're not comparing apples to apples. So we're not looking at comparing, let's say, men with suboptimal or low testosterone to men with right. optimal. They're looking at men that abuse testosterone and say, oh, there you go. See, yeah. it causes heart problems. It causes left ventricular hypertrophy. It causes, but these guys are taking yeah. 10 times the dose that you would take to be in a normal. A lot of the lines of their other lifestyle and, choices too. Yeah. And also that when you think about test, let's take thyroid replacement. Thyroid yeah. replacement is super common. No one blinks an eye. No, mm -hmm. Nothing. I think in the next 10 years, that's going to happen for hormone replacement. If you are not on hormone replacement, people are going to be like, oh, you, it's going to be the equivalent of, oh, you have low thyroid. Why are you not taking thyroid? Why aren't you taking that? I agree. I think, but it's going to take 10 years. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, what's interesting to me when I, I learned this not that long ago, um, if you took a person and gave them 10 times their normal amount of testosterone, they might get some side effects, but they would be okay. I, you can't do that with almost any other hormone. If you did that with insulin, they'd die. If you do that with thyroid, they'd probably die. If you do that with estrogen, they'd be a raging bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, yeah. yeah. So although testosterone could do that in some people yeah. too, but uh, but yeah. So it's it is interesting that it's gotten this kind of negative, uh, you know, like what's going on. And again, it points all to, I think maybe not knowing the real health benefits of muscle. Muscle being relegated to well, this is what keeps you mobile but not what keeps you healthy and what contributes to longevity. It's all about keeping fat away. Yeah, and I think the dichotomy between muscle and, and sport. So really, yeah. it ha skeletal muscle has not been thought of as the pinnacle of health and wellness. It's always been thought about as sport. Right. So with sport, people think about performance-enhancing drugs and testosterone, but it, it shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. It's more important, in my opinion, than even thinking about fat. Yeah. Yeah. And if we were to close the gap of the conversation, that muscle is really the pinnacle of everything. It is the pinnacle of how you're going to be able to show up. I've I've never had a, a patient say to me, you know, I, I really regret being strong. I mean, that was a huge mistake. And you'll never hear that. Mm -mm. But if we begin to kind of close the gap of what muscle really is and then begin to think about what are the things that we can do to enhance skeletal muscle health, then testosterone wouldn't be so much of a, a black sheep versus, oh, there, there's obesity medication. 
people aren't like, oh my gosh, you're taking medication for obesity. Mm. The other thing is the connection between uh, muscle and uh, cognitive health. I mean, obviously yeah. your brain uh, controls muscle, moves it, contracts it. Uh, there's proprioception that's involved, which involves the brain as well. There's the insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. uh, aspect that muscle contributes to, which we know is probably a major player in dementia and Alzheimer's. <clears throat> Maybe if we help make that connection, because, you know, when you think a healthy yeah. brain, there's that old, look, look, there's that old myth of the, of the, the meathead. Oh, he's an idiot. He's built, you know, he just works out or she, they, they're stupid. And then there's the brainiac who's really skinny, doesn't have any muscle, yeah, yeah. but that's couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Actually, I never thought about that. that that's a, a really good point. Um, so I did my fellowship in geriatrics, in nutritional sciences and geriatrics, which means uh, a huge part of that was looking at memory and aging and body composition. You know, a geriatrician is someone who studies an individual over the age of 65. And at Wash U, where I was, there are specialists in Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's dementia. Um, there's vascular dementia, there's Alzheimer's dementia, there's uh, Lewy body dementia, all different kinds. But when you think about preventable causes of dementia or cognitive impairment, you have to think about the metabolic implications. Mm. Um, the brain is an organ just like the pancreas and the liver. And when you are metabolically unhealthy, when you have excess body fat, when you have higher levels of glucose, you are more and you are more insulin resistant, these things all over time affect the brain. And when you train, exercise, of course, does a uh, multitude of things. There's probably nothing more impactful than training. Mm -hmm. Diet is probably not even as impactful as for exercise. longevity. Yeah, I've seen the studies on that. It's crazy. I mean, it's exercise. Mm -hmm. When you think about exercise, you think about contracting skeletal muscle. Contracting skeletal muscle releases these myokines. One of these myokines is BDNF um, that impacts the brain for neurogenesis, mm -hmm. cognition. We, we all know that. Of course, endorphins everybody talks about. Then there is, again, that implication of metabolic correction, of utilizing exercising skeletal muscle, utilizes glucose without the uh, need of insulin becomes very important, especially when you think about brain health, because brain is a very, it is very affected by body composition over time. So mm. the wider the waistline, the lower the brain volume. And I know that that's a very robust statement to make, but you will see in the literature that the better your body composition, the lower your body fat, the better your brain function. Now, what's time. interesting about what you're saying, because so many thoughts flying through my head. So you said training is more important for longevity than diet. We've placed more of a focus on diet because when it comes to the scale moving down, yeah, diet will do that faster than just exercise. In fact, you can exercise and not lose a pound. You could obviously cut your calories and lose a pound. And because we've tied body fat to everything, then that is more of an important thing. The other thing too is I've seen this data and I would love to confirm it with you. Obviously, if you're super overweight, you see in, you know increased rates of mortality or whatever. The underweight, people who are very underweight yeah. probably have worse outcomes or just as bad. They do. So what is that showing? Um, you know, I think part of that, well, especially as you age. Um, so one of the things as a, a geriatrician, surprisingly, they do not recommend that you lose weight, depending on, obviously, this also depends on how overweight you are. Because right. if you were to get injured or you were to get sick, the body has to readily use stores of energy. energy. Yeah. And, and so that that is why. I believe. And then also, but, you know, on the same hand, you're not going to be able to survive without skeletal muscle. No. So when you think about cancer cachexia, which is this highly catabolic state, the thing that kills you is the loss of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, again, so, yeah, underweight is a Yeah, because underweight means not enough fat, but also means not enough muscle. Right. I don't know anybody with a lot of muscle who's underweight right. <laughs> for their height or whatever. According right. to what, okay. what what's the minimal dose to positively impact somebody who's like concerned about this? Like we got someone who's listening that has a grandma, grandpa, or even a parent yeah. that's aging that hasn't exercised at all. Yeah. Um, what would you like? What does the literature say about like if you at least do this weight training wise, it makes this big of an impact? Yeah, um, it's really fascinating at how malleable skeletal muscle is. Um, and how dynamic it is, there's literature in 85-year-olds that they can improve muscle mass and strength yeah. from very limited activity. It could be from sitting to standing. That's what I did. I trained mm. I trained there people in the age group for years, and they would come see me once a week. And Dr. Lyon, I would do maybe 20 to 30 minutes 
of, of exercise with them. And the rest of the time was like talking and resting <laughs> and, you know, whatever. So we would get through maybe a grand total of six sets of some very, like, okay, what you just said, sitting down, standing up, that was like that a foundational was, exercise. But that was probably high intensity training for them. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they would get, I mean, their health would improve dramatically in a very short period of time. And they thought, oh, I didn't know I could get it, stronger. And, you know, there's evidence. We worked on some of these earlier studies, um, the early 2000s, where they looked at um, two groups of women. And this was at the University of Illinois, two groups of women. And one group, um, had the food guide pyramid, mm. and I'm going to get to the exercise piece. Had the, they ate the food guide pyramid, which is a total disaster, yeah. right? We know that like what is paid for by big food. Yeah. Terrible, terrible disaster. And then the other group had uh, double the RDA of protein, and they in they and both were isocaloric. But I want to get to the exercise component. And what they found when they looked at the synergistic effect of exercise of dietary protein and exercise, they did three days a week of stretching. So that, that was the exercise intervention. Yeah. So it was really limited. It was three days a week of yoga and then, um, you know, some walking. They were able to maintain their, their muscle mass. Mm. Wow. And they were able to maintain their muscle mass even on a, a lower protein diet. And I'm not advocating a lower protein diet, but it was the point is, is that the influence of exercise, even great? some mm -hmm. basic movements. So if someone is listening here and they're not doing anything, number one, don't do the food guide pyramid right? That's like a bad idea in general. Um, but if you are eating not an ideal diet, just by doing three days a week of exercise, which can include yoga, you'll have an impact. It's more than what they're doing. You also, you said something that we try and communicate all the time, which I think is so important is when Sal said the getting up and down, you said, yeah, that was probably like high intensity training. Yeah. It's so important that if you're a coach and trainer that you understand that like meeting them where they're at, like you could, yoga could be a lot for somebody yeah. who's never done anything or not moving. And so sometimes I think as trainers, uh, or at least I was guilty of this as a, as a young trainer is thinking like, Oh, we got to be in here for an hour and you need at least three to four days a week. And I need to be doing this. And it's like, man, I'm taking somebody who's 50 something years old, never lifted weights in their life before. Yeah. It's like, man, just getting this person to come in here and practice these movements. Yeah. Is huge. Dr. Lyon, one of my clients was, she had a walker and one of her exercises was letting go of the walker and just trying to stand as tall as she could. And we would time her for 10 seconds at first. And it. it was 15 seconds. And it was a strength training exercise for her. And I think a big message here is how do we get people to start early? Like mm -hmm. really early. Yeah. We yeah. all have kids. How do we get them to start early so then it doesn't become a habit or... <clears throat> Um, a situation that they have to change. Yeah. You know, I don't want, and I can appreciate people coming in in their 50s have never done anything, but I want to get to the point where, you know, we have a bunch of trainers in the room now and and we're all relatively fit. I mean, you guys are fit. I'm relatively fit. Yeah. But that we, that we think about how do we become responsible for our fellow human? Because at the rate that we're going, we're going to hit a tipping point where the, the, the normal is going to be overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, normal, we're getting close. Yeah. But just the normal population. And so then the question becomes, there's going to be just two, you know, just huge division. There's going to be a group of people that are fit and then a group of people that are not and not exercising. And how do we get the other individuals who don't quite understand the influence to get on board? Yeah, the political implications of that are huge because it's already like this, by the way. When you pay your health insurance and you're healthy, you're subsidizing uh, for the unhealthy people. So when you have 60% or 70% of the population that's obese and sick, that means the other 30% are going to support that 70% with the costs of trying to keep them alive and, you know, all of their, their health issues. Let's, let, you, you mentioned the food pyramid. Why is that so bad? I mean, that was the biggest social experiment I think that we had. So the, the food pyramid was um, really when everything changed. And the food pyramid was a diet that was, you know, 45% carbohydrates. And it was, you know, the base was grains and, and carbs and protein was maybe 10% and fats. It was a social experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what does it cost? Well, I mean, do you that? think there was, was there good intention behind it? Or do you think that that was completely manipulated by like, the food industry and so like that. Like, what's your theory on that? Like, did we go into it thinking, like, cause you say experiment, like, oh, we think this is a good idea. Or do you think it was manipulated or played with? Um, 
I think a lot of it is not based on health. A lot of the initiatives and a lot of the information that we have received for decades is not solely based on evidence-based information. It's so ironic though, because you're giving health advice, but it's, it's not challenging. based on health. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's challenging because for example, when you think about the food guide pyramid and you think about these protein recommendations that haven't been updated since the seventies, where, where did they come from? And really, is it because they established that this is the amount of carbohydrates? Was there really evidence for that? Um, there was a seven, was it yeah. called the seven country study, Doug? Who was the doctor that yeah, did Ansel that? Keys. There you go. Yeah. He took out two countries that didn't yeah. fit that criteria. Right. I mean, <laughs> there's a, a lot of, and it, it's interesting when you look back at the history, it's never been about the science only. Mm. It's been about policy. It's been about, you know, there's a religious aspect to it. There is an emotional aspect to it, and it's really damaged our society, and it's really damaged uh, going forward. There's a big pu there's a big push or narrative that's out there that is trying to push the average person into a plant based or vegan diet, almost and sometimes directly, but usually kind of insinuating that protein is not good, animal protein is not good, it's not healthy. What do you think would happen if the average person just said, "I'm going to go plant based. I'm going to not eat." Meat, eggs, and milk. Well, right now, 70% of our diet's already plant-based. We're pretty fat and pretty unhealthy. If we are going to further reduce that, um, or rather increase that plant-based number, what's going to happen? We're not going to go in a better direction. Mm. Right now, we're 30% animal uh, products, 70% plant-based products. If we listen to the narrative, and that's from NHANES data, so that's the largest data set that we have. So if we were to take a step back and then actually execute on those recommendations, I mean, it's going to be another disaster. You know, like the same thing with cholesterol. So there was that whole period of time that we should reduce. I, I don't remember if it was in the 60s. It was, maybe it was a little bit later, but um, Time Magazine came out with this article where it had like butter and yes. like browning yeah, yeah. face or something mm -hmm. like that. Yes. Um, or maybe it was eggs in the frowning face where uh, there was this recommendation that we should reduce our cholesterol to 300 uh, milligrams of cholesterol a day. And everyone, all heart disease was going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, they did that, nothing happened. And I think that actually heart disease went up um, and they ended up taking out cholesterol guidelines 2015. So people did exactly what they were told to do and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The food guide pyramid, people did exactly what they were supposed to do. Everybody got fat. Mm -hmm. There's that cover right there. Eggs and bacon. Eggs and bacon, oh, cholesterol. Yeah. Um, and they were wrong. They were totally wrong. Super wrong. I almost, <laughs> I almost feel like this direction towards vegan and away from animal products is even scarier. Oh, I mean, it is. It is. I mean, I think that's I think that's worse than just trying to it avoid is. fat or avoid cholesterol. Right. Like going all plant based for yeah. the majority. I think the where Sal was alluding to is that. People already that eat the average diet have a really hard time hitting the adequate amount of protein they need to sustain muscle mass on their body. Well, or we're just not nutrients. Doing it. We're, we're, we're yeah. not doing it. And Essential think about nutrients. it this way. So that the recommendation at 0.8 grams per kg is 0.37 grams per pound. So if you're a hundred if you're a hundred and fifteen pound female, that's forty five grams of dietary protein yeah. a day. Mm -hmm. Now, these numbers were developed, these the RDA was developed on high quality protein. So the RDA wow. is developed on high quality animal-based proteins. Wow. Hmm. The recommendation of 0.8 grams per kilogram came from young men to maintain, you know, nitrogen balance, which in and of itself is not a health outcome. Hmm. So now if we believe in, do you believe that the RDA is enough? No. 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 The RDA is the minimum to prevent deficiencies. The RDA is based on animal-based proteins. If we then go plant-based and we further reduce <sighs> our dietary protein, you tell me what's going to happen. Hold on. Let me illustrate this <laughs> just so people understand just how insane this is, okay? It's already hard yeah. to get protein from plant-based sources. Now, I know people will see those pictures of, uh, you know, this many beans or whatever. Yeah, you go ahead and try, try and eat it. 100 yep. grams of protein from, from uh, you know, non-animal <laughs> sources. No one's going to want to hang out with you. No, Deal with it's, it's going to yeah, be no terrible. Thanks. And now you're, you're talking about protein quality as well, and studies are very clear on this. Unless your protein intake's super high. When I say super high, like 
I weigh 205 pounds, I'm consuming 200 grams of protein. Unless your protein intake is super high, and there's lots of studies that show this, that animal protein versus plant protein, one gram of animal protein is equivalent to like one and a half grams of, right. of plant protein. So not only is it hard to get the protein from the plant sources, but you also need more of it to do the same work. So we're literally going to make it impossible for most people unless they supplement like crazy. Wait, but, which, but, but wait, so we're talking about protein as a generic concept. And I agree with you. Now, how are you going to get iron, your bioavailable yeah, iron? Yeah, how yeah, are you going to get creatine? How are you going to get B12? So if we've just focused on dietary protein and go more plant-based, could we get enough? Yeah, but what about everything else? Mm. What are we going to do to the other physiological needs? Yeah. Well, we could just- Do you have, do you have a prediction we, based off of that? Like, okay, let, let's say, because it is feeling like it's going this direction, that we're pushing this and more and more people yep. are, are going plant-based. Um, are, are there things that you, knowing what you know already, yep. like we're going to see an increase in this, we're going right. to see like, can what you predict? Are all the oh, yeah. Yeah, you ready for it? Yeah, we love those. to do All right, so here, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Um, well, you know, it's very interesting. So it's like a lot of the younger people or the influence that are, that are arguing for plant-based. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 20s, maybe early 30s. Uh, again, as a geriatrician, that you don't see geriatricians say to anybody, go more plant-based. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. terrible uh, advice. medical practice, terrible advice. We are going to see rates of osteoporosis, of sarcopenia, because we are going to, because we, everyone in this room, we are going to change the narrative and people are going to start to test muscle mass directly. We are going to see an exponential level of low muscle mass. We are going to see uh, osteoporosis like we've never seen it before. We are going to see uh, injury, um, uh, fractures and falls like we've never seen. Uh, I'll add to that. Uh, you're going to see higher rates of depression and anxiety uh, and mental illness as well, which are all directly connected to, you mentioned B12 deficiency. Uh, you mentioned iron uh, deficiency, both of which can make you feel more depressed or and or more anxious. You didn't talk about vitamin D deficiency, which is also going to be more common which definitely is connected to depression and anxiety. By the way, if people look this up, look it up. Look up the rates of mental illness in the ones that I talked about and people who are plant-based versus people who eat an omnivore diet. And you're not even comparing like a healthy omnivore diet. Yeah. You're just looking at the general unhealthy population and you see that the rates are much higher. But, you know, we could always give them, you know, enzyolytics and antidepressants. <laughs> you know, and the other aspect is that we have beef consumption that is down, dairy consumption yeah. is down, but like all of the high quality foods, they're, they're lower mm -hmm. than they've ever been before and ultra processed foods are higher. And then if you look at other countries, the other countries would think it's crazy to say, um, you know, yeah, get rid of, go more plant-based. They, it is, a luxury that we can even have this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so back to your point, what is going to happen if we go more plant-based? Well, uh, again, the RDA is the minimum to prevent deficiencies. It's based on animal-based products. Now we're going to further reduce that. What's going to happen? Okay, so cholesterol, they were wrong about that, consuming cholesterol. They actually, FDA actually says it's no longer a nutrient of concern. So they even That's said this correct, themselves. correct, yep. What about sodium? Sodium is... <laughs> you know, bad for you, causes high blood pressure, avoid yeah. it. Everybody got to go low sodium diet. There's products out there that are all low sodium. Have we been misled with sodium as well? I actually, I believe so. Um, I, I'm obviously not a sodium expert, but I believe that we have been misled. It is an essential nutrient. Um, and I think that if you look back at the history, that sodium is something that animals always um, search for. There's, you know, salt licks or whatever it is. They're always, it's very difficult to get into the diet. Um, the other aspect of it is that when you think about high sodium diet or high salt diet, th will there, there be some individuals that are sensitive to sodium? It's probably maybe 20% of the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, the majority of people are not going to be affected by sodium. And it is, it's essential. Could we also be looking at a correlation? Uh, I think if you took a thousand everyday people uh, just regular people, so no controls. And you just took out the people or identified the people consuming the most sodium. There's probably a correlation between that and heavily processed foods totally. or fast food, right? Totally. Okay, so I, I, cause I think that's what we're probably dealing with because you eat a whole food diet mm. and you salt the hell out of your food. It's not that much salt. Right. Okay. Right. All right. I, and I, again, um, I think that we have been really misled 
about sodium and is it really a sodium issue or is it a processed food issue? Is it the lack of potassium? Is it the lack mm -hmm. of other things? Okay. All right. Talk, staying on the diet topic, um, fasting, I remember when that became kind of big here in the space and it was, you know, people were touting. It was so great. We obviously, we were cringing every time we saw people say fast to lose fat, not, not necessarily a good idea. Here's something I noticed as a trainer and a coach, all of us notice this as well. And then you see messages, even the fasting zealots who think it's so great. It seems like women have oftentimes a more negative, if they do have a negative effects from fasting, they seem to be more lack for lack of a better term, sensitive to the potential negative effects of fasting than men. Is that true? Is there a difference between men and women, how they react to fasting? And what about fasting in general? I guess? Um, so let's talk about fasting in general. I, I don't necessarily believe that there's a magic to fasting. I think that it ultimately comes down to calorie control. Um, the goal, you know, the question is, why are you fasting? I don't think that there's anything wrong with fasting. I think that, is it for bowel rest? Is it for, you know, everyone uses the magic term autophagy. How long mm -hmm. would someone have to fast for it? I think that there's multiple ways to get an end result. Um, but fasting definitely allows for calorie control, definitely allows for uh, gut reset. It can definitely help uh, some aspects of circadian alignment, depending on when you're eating versus when mm. you're fasting. Does it affect men and women differently? Um, I think that there's a lot of influence of hormones that we don't, that they're so variable for women in particular that we don't know. Mm. And that I was talking to our mutual friend, uh, Lane Norton, we were just texting the other day and I was saying, you know, what is your, uh, what are your thoughts on the hormonal aspects of fasting or exercise, et cetera? And, you know, he, I think him and I were very much in alignment. There's so much variability. Yeah. There's just so much variability. I, I think that we're very behind when it comes to looking at female physiology, just in general. Mm. That being said, um, you know, if a woman's body perceives that she is under too much stress, and I'm using kind of nebulous terms because I think that this kind of relates to fertility. Sure. That if a woman's body perceives that she is under too much stress, and let's say, um, again, I say this cautiously, that cortisol is elevated over time or she becomes amenorrheic because of perceived stress, and you add fasting into that, I think that that can be a negative. Um you know, uh, rather than eating earlier on and, and, you know, allowing the body to kind of settle. Okay. Is there a low body fat kind of factor to that with women, especially? Yeah. It, you know, it depends on the woman. Yeah. It, it really depends on the woman. Um, again, obviously you want to make sure that she is having a regular menstrual cycle and that she is ovulating. Should we say, you know, 20% is ideal for getting pregnant? I don't know if that we can say that. It's, it's certainly very individual, you know? Do, do you, yeah. um, when it, when it comes, you just mentioned, uh, you know, a woman's cycle. Is that a really good indicator to a woman that she's healthy versus not? I would say so. Yeah. Cause I, 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 I use that so. quite a bit as a trainer. Like if yeah. I had a female athlete, um, if she lost her period, I knew we were going too hard or yep. she was dieting too much. I knew right away. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, I think that that's a really good perspective. Um, Yeah. Unfortunately, it's accepted in the female sporting world. I know. Oh, you lose your period. It's part I of the know. game. Yeah. And in the in uh, military, in, uh, same with women in the military. Wow. If they're training really hard, it's the first thing that goes. You mentioned hormonal fluctuations. Yeah. Now, I know as a man, they say, if you get your testosterone levels checked, do it in the morning. That's when it's highest. So it's the most accurate reading of your high levels. But our hormones are pretty stable month in and month out compared to a woman's cycle where she gets these really kind of, you know, in comparison, radical changes. Yeah. How do you test a woman's hormones then? Because she could be at any moment, any time <laughs> yeah. in her cycle. Yeah. Do you? You should be able to tell. For the most part, you should be able to tell based on looking at everything. Okay. FSH, LH. Um, and then you have ranges for that yes. time. Estrogens, okay. progesterone, testosterone. Yes, you should be able to tell. Okay. And then ratios of estrogen and progesterone, what are we looking for during the, you know, what, what is it, what is that you're looking at when you're looking at those? So I used to look at those. I don't look at them anymore. Why? I just, I feel it, like you have to really, again, because the, the cycles are so variable mm. and people are so variable, it depends on, it ultimately goes to how the woman is feeling. Oh, I think when you're early on sense. in your medical mm -hmm. practice, you're testing everything, you're testing everything, you're testing everything all the time. And then over years of clinical practice, you'll you'll hear a woman and she'll be saying, listen, I'm having a lot of anxiety. I can't sleep. 
X, Y, and Z, and you might look at her blood level of progesterone, which is typically low anyway, but you know that she needs it. And you know that there isn't going to be a downside. And with her levels of estrogen, you know, from a, a clinical perspective, if a woman is still menstruating, you're not really going to give her estrogen. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't look at those ratios anymore. I know it's crazy, but it's no, just that's like actually, personal training. Yeah. That brings up a really interesting question <laughs> because just like it. off air, we were talking, we were comparing like how Western medicine does things compared to like how you do things with patients. And I mean, we should know better too. This is how we were as trainers. Like, how much we were by the book when we first started and then how much we threw exactly. out the book exactly. later yeah. on. So I would exactly love- Exactly what happens. It is. It's like, you need to know that stuff. It's very important. Like but then you baseline. realize like, okay, yeah. now none of this yeah. matters. It's, it's like- it I mean, it matters, but it's like, okay, but and it, this is probably why there's this like, um, this belief or, and I wouldn't say belief because that even, that even insinuates that it's not true. You talk to a lot of women and they say a lot of women have this complaint about going to the doctor. They- Gaslight me. They ignore totally. me. They don't hear about how I feel. They look at my labs. They tell me I'm fine. Right. Tell me I'm crazy. And what you're saying is that's why. Because you're just looking at the numbers. <laughs> yeah. You're not listening to what she's saying. So yeah. what are so take us through. I'd love to hear some like questions that where you're at in your career now compared to where you when you first started. Oh, right. Yeah. Like what's different that you ask now? And like what are like huge clues for you that maybe you wouldn't have asked or even seen? Back? Yeah. So the first thing that I do um, in my practice is you got to figure out who the person is. There are archetypes of people. Hmm. And hmm. when you figure out who the person is, you'll get a, it'll be a whole different perspective of what you're going to hear. Okay. Explain that. I'll like, give you an example. Yeah, yeah. So the, I take care of a lot of uh, females and a lot of guys and a lot of men that are very successful, very driven type A individuals. Yeah. And the first thing that I'll say is like, how are you doing? And every single one of them, I'm great. I'm good. <laughs> That's the I'm answer. Great. Always a I'm great. And Kill so it. I already know, right? I'm, um, I already know. And so the next question I'm going to ask is, so the last time you had a big sale, a big launch, a big thing, whatever it is, how did you feel afterwards? Hmm. And the guy that says, nah, I was neutral. It was good. It's just what I do. His answers are going to be so much different than the entrepreneur that says, I crash and burn, uh, doc. I crash and burn every single time. Oh, hmm. Interesting. So that that's an example of, so now I know that very the entrepreneur, so the, the entrepreneur typically that has gone in, they're very neutral, even though, um, you know, like some of the entrepreneurs are traveling to different countries all the time, like yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Huge book launch and uh, just totally stable right after, Yeah, you know, like uh, just totally capable. And then the other entrepreneur, uh, and I'll give you an example because where they are in their career is totally different. The other entrepreneur does this huge event in Vegas every year. And every year I wait for the call about how shitty he's going to feel afterwards, <laughs> how he's going to be off his diet and he's going to be not training. Hmm. And so that's, so when I get a perspective of who the person is, so for example, the guy that is neutral going in, I know that he's going to be very steady and stable. I can ask him what he ate um, three weeks ago on a Wednesday and he'll probably know because he's consistent. Mm. Um, he is probably very tight on his vices. He will probably execute on his blood work. He probably will not want a ton of contact, but he'll want me to be on top of all of his stuff. Oh, interesting. And that's one type. And then the other type that is having these massive ebbs and flows, probably is going to be bad at getting his blood work done. He's probably going to micromanage or, or overthink every kind of treatment, whether it's testosterone replacement, et cetera. Um, and also going to be very detached from how he truly feels. So this is cool because we have coaches and trainers in here today that are listening to this. And we kind of talk a little bit about this. Now that you've learned this, like you can read these different archetypes. Yeah. Do you fork like they, you're meeting you're already you're in your head you're like okay i know i know who this totally. is yep. do you forecast it for them like yeah. do you oh, like yeah. Yeah. you're gonna be like this yep. you're gonna tell Gets me their buy-in yep oh it's so good and then they trust you yes and then it is a relationship where they feel understood i think that one reason why i have personally been successful as a physician is i understand who's in front of me i can relate to them yeah mm -hmm. And I get them. I get w where they're coming from. Yeah. And a physician should get the person. It's not about the labs. Yeah, yeah. 
It's not about, you know, as a physician, you should be good at diagnosing an illness. That's your job. What are the, what are the, uh, the, the pros and cons of each of those archetypes? Like, like you, you said some of the things that they're going to be good or bad at, but what are some of the other things that like, uh, that each one is. Oh yeah. Challenging? And, and there are different, there are, yeah, I'm sure. there are multiple different, uh, archetypes, but I, I think for your listener, you know, there's like the reluctant patient who has been everywhere and, and you know, has tried everything, but they're jumping around from thing to thing and there's all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. So the. The pro patient, like the the person who's able to be neutral, right? And that's just an example mm. of you You tell me your habits and I'll be able to tell you where you are in your career. Mm. I'm telling you, you tell me your habits. I don't even need to know what you do. And I will tell you what level you are in in your career. Oh, that's cool. Um, so the, the good thing about kind of that CEO type is that you know you have to get someone else on board. You know you need to get their assistant on board, their wife on board. Half the time, I don't even deal with that guy. <laughs> I just go right to the wife. <laughs> so so totally hey, so I was so going to say, I'm I was so going to say, hey, I, Katrina, I get Adam, know. get his blood work done. I, I don't even fucking know, go, too. I don't even want to hear you. I don't even group, <laughs> I don't even hear I, you. I group text with the wife. Yeah. Like, hey, did this motherfucker get this shit done or not? <laughs> <laughs> like, just bypass yeah. them completely. Those guys, <laughs> extremely Adam's, Adam's successful. Right now. I, I hope she's going to make me feel okay about it though right now. Extremely successful. As long as they have someone in their corner. Very handsome. Come on, Show up here at this time to get this done yeah. you know like yeah, yeah. they will try to cancel the appointment they will try to move <laughs> it like, it is it is standard this is weird it is yeah. standard yeah. right you yeah. have to have if they're supposed to be on this medication or this supplement it has to already be sent for three months a renewal has to come up they will move they will do this in fact if they need blood work you better have someone sent to their house mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's they uh, do that. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. uh, so we are very skilled at dealing with these patients. Okay. We are skilled. I don't even send you. Just like you don't even have to know. Just do the thing. Yeah. That's so awesome. The um, the other type of patient who is kind of um a more of a rookie entrepreneur or a rookie individual um, those guys are more challenging. They will put off a lot of these tasks. Mm. They will put off. You have to be on top of them at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that's because they're at the place in their career where they haven't figured out that they might need that assistant or yep. they need that person? Yep. And they still think totally. they can handle everything, nope. doing yeah. and they're falling yeah. short. And also, juggling too many and, things. And also, they don't. They fail to recognize that um, there's this kind of interchange that happens, right? That they think that they can outrun their physical health, mm -hmm. and you can't. So, for all the trainers listen, listening, you guys behind me, um, or if you're listening to this, as high as you are going to go is solely based on your physical health and wellness. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you cannot- That's your limiting that. factor. It's yeah. a limiting factor. It's you. Always. And the people at the top, they know that. They just know it. And so they are not trying to, and yes, there is a grind, right? We all grind in the beginning, but then all of a sudden we, it, there comes to a point where we're like, okay, if I keep grinding this, there's this predictable, I'm going to go high and burn out, go high mm. and burn out. Uh, how are you going to do that? You know what you're highlighting yeah. right now uh, just broadly is the difference between like concierge medicine or private medicine versus working with your insurance companies and those standards. I mean, you said you got to know the person, right? But the yeah. current system really almost makes it impossible. Impossible. I mean, and, yeah. and here's why it's so important. Like I'll use one of the most medically treated, uh, for lack of a better terms, conditions that we have is pain. Pain is one of the most treated over the counter and, and, uh, prescription wise, people will use medications for pain. You can't really separate your perception or the, the physiological, what's happening with the pain and how you perceive it or your relationship. You can't separate the two. We know people who are depressed, who get out, get out of depression, all of a sudden pain goes away. Some people respond to pain medicine differently. Other pain seems to be phantom. We don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. It's a very strong psychological component. <clears throat> yes. But yes. without working with the person, how could you, and that's just one that's yeah. just one thing. Energy is another one. Like, you know, there's definitely physiological things happening. This is why people don't like their doctors. Yeah. So, okay. So <laughs> this so, is why they go in and they go, oh, I mean, it's so funny when you say your doctor, like, oh, you yeah. have to hide behind something. Okay. So what's the big difference? Wait, say, <clears throat> how long do you spend with a patient, a concierge, <clears throat> or what would that look like versus like, typically I go to the yeah. doctor is what it looks like. Well, right? first of all, um, it's, is this, this is, I'm going to say this for the provider. If you are at a place that there has to be a good match between the provider and the patient. Mm. Um, there is, it's, it has to be a team. So for example, if you come into my practice, you're interviewed because it has to be a good match. Right. 
uh, for both people. Um, so my initial visit is an hour and a half. Wow. Hmm. An hour and a half with the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Typically well, you, yeah. you go to the doctor. You five to fi- You don't even get fi- yeah. it's 15 minute visits and yeah. only three of it's with the doctor. Yeah. yeah. Like, That's hilarious. Other, it's true. 12, yeah, it is. That's all you get. So yeah. you should have in your life, you should have a good accountant, a good partner and a good doctor. Mm. <laughs> I like mm. that. Because you got to be able to call on those people at any point in time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, what's interesting about this because people look at the math and they say, oh my God, it's so expensive. They say this also about exercising, paying for a gym, eating right, whatever. But it's really expensive to be unhealthy. Yes. Also (laughs) time-consuming. People are like, I don't have time for this concierge doctor. I don't have time for an hour and a half for a visit. You think you're going to have time for uh, sickness? If you don't have time for health, you're in you're yeah. definitely wrong. What are what are some of your biggest, uh, I guess, pet peeves with uh, the current system in terms of testing and not testing? Like, what are some of the big like big issues you have with yeah. some of the ways that they operate? Um, I think that it's very algorithmic. Uh, really, they really look at the basics, and you're not going to catch anything with the basics. You'll catch big stuff, but you're not going to catch the stuff like the precursors before things. For example. When you go to a doctor and you look at a lipid panel, they don't necessarily measure ApoB. No. ApoB is really important for cardiovascular disease. When you go to the doctor, they might measure a fasting glucose level, but they don't necessarily measure fasting insulin. Just very small things like that. When you get your thyroid panel done, typically a physician doesn't do, they just do a screening test for TSH. Mm. They don't do free T3, free T4 antibodies. Do you think we overprescribe? Yes. And, okay. <laughs> I guess I, I don't have to say yes. it, do I? <laughs> yes. We have 40 million people on statins. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So example. I'll, I'll be more specific. Yes. Do you think we're overprescribing antidepressants and enzyolytics, especially to women, uh, and they're feeling those symptoms because of hormone imbalances, totally. nutrition deficiencies, totally. and the fact that they don't, they're not active and we're just like, here, take this. Yeah. And, feel and, better. and I will say um, there is this misconception that physicians are paid to prescribe um, that has not been That's my not experience. Yeah. That's not been my experience. I have not seen that in clinical practice. Um, but again, we have to think, where does this education come from? Where is this unifying education come from? So the, the people at the top educate physicians to then execute on this thing mm. because physicians want to do the right thing. Um, I know you guys have a coaching program where you're training up other coaches. And so the, the question becomes, where is this top-down approach? So if a physician was taught to do something different and maybe um, deploy a different treatment modality, then they could have, you know, probably better impact. Yeah. They're working with the tools they were given. They're mm-hmm. working with the tools. Yeah. And the, unfortunately- if you, give a, if you tell a contractor to build this house and you only give him a screwdriver and a saw, he's going to do what he can with yes. it, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, um, I remember I was- I watched a lecture uh, from obesity medicine, which is so funny that there's an obesity medicine um, division. And it talked all about like this plant-based diet and about how bad red meat was. And I, and obviously this physician talking wasn't a nutrition expert. They didn't have any, uh, they had ulterior motives, I suppose. But then that was the message that was portrayed to all the other physicians. And so then they believe that and they deploy that information. And again, so- becomes really challenging. Do you think people should stop seeing their doctor if their doctor's obese? Ooh. Ooh, that's Ooh. a spicy question. What I will say is that um, it's important to find a provider that models what the import- what an individual believes to be as the importance of health and okay. wellness. So and no. that's how I will. <laughs> so I will. I will answer the question by uh, yes, that was good. Um, that uh, I, I believe that you have to feel as if the person is doing what they're telling you to do, and they are doing it yeah. themselves. Yeah, I think that's important uh, for anybody who's helping. Someone. Would you go to a trainer that was overweight? I mean, unless they were they've been losing weight for a while and they're on that journey. I mean, it's hard, right? Because um, you, but you, did you don't say, believe in what you preach. Yeah, I know I teased you like dodging like Neo there, but I do think that you you bring up a good point because I I would consider a trainer if 
there was something specific that I yeah. was looking for that I thought that person, that provider, yeah. they had a very had. specific skill or something. Right, like, yeah. I yeah. like, like maybe them, like they were they're just brilliant at totally. teaching biomechanics, and I know that I'm not good at and, it, and I can get that from. And them. also, well, we should clarify. So uh, I wouldn't care if uh, a neuro my neurosurgeon was over uh, was obese or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I suppose it just depends on what you're trying right. to get out of it. What yeah, is what example. is it that you're right? Yeah. But I get what you're saying though. It's like when you're trying to get someone to uh, adhere to changing their lifestyle. Uh, one of the biggest um, roadblocks, this is anybody, by the way, you go to a spiritual leader, you go to whatever, when they look like a hypocrite, you don't want to listen to them because they're telling you to make all these hard lifestyle changes. And the first way that you're going to discredit them when you hit a roadblock is to be like, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Why would I yeah. listen to you? We do that to our parents when we're kids. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Uh, you know? Yeah. Um, what, how do you feel about the GLP-1 agonist? So this is blowing up right now. These are uh, exploding. I, yes. They're all over the place and to the point where, I actually talked about this on the show, uh, major snack food manufacturers are meeting together to try to figure out yeah. this problem because people are going to eat less of their food. Losing customers. And they're trying to figure, really figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. They have used physiology and pharmacology to outsmart the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think crazy. about them? Are they, how effective are they? Do you use uh, them with your practice? Okay. So we are talking about, there's GLP-1 agonist, which that would be the semaglutide, Wagovi, everyone's talking about Ozempic. Yeah. And then there's trizepatide, which is going to be the next really hot topic. And if it hasn't been already, Mongerno. Um, these medications are incretins and um, GLP and GIP are both uh, produced in the body. And I will say, I think they're incredibly effective. I think they are safe and very effective. We have not seen, and by the way, the GLP-1 agonists, they have been around for a long time. I think that they first came out 2009. Okay. Um, so that's over 20 years. Um, they've been around for a very long time and I think that they have very good safety uh, side effect profile. People will say, what about the black box warning with this thyroid cancer? And mm. that was, um, I think it's an incidental finding and also the rodent models. There's a, a the GLP, um, the receptors are highly concentrated in um, thyroid for rodents, not for humans. Oh, okay. So I think that it has kind of misguided some of the information. What do I think about them? I think they're incredibly effective. And for a GIP or a, a GLP-1 agonist, you might lose 13% body fat. For trizepatide or Mongerno, you could lose 22%. Wow. Now, let's take it a step further. What is the risk of, you know, what are the outcomes that we're looking for? What are we trying to protect people from? Um, themselves, obesity. Yeah. When an individual is very obese, Lots of things go wrong. Get fatty liver disease. You can get scarring, get cirrhosis. You can get all, like the, the list goes on. Atherosclerosis, hypertension, et cetera. Yeah. So these medications, if we know, for example, someone loses 10% of their body weight, could reverse um, fatty liver disease. These medications provide people a way to do that. I mean, what about the muscle loss that we see? Is that just a result of the fact they're not, they're just eating less or not eating protein yeah, and not lifting weights? So look, I have not been able to find a mechanism of action. Hmm. I, and I, in fact, think with trizepatide, I think it's going to improve. Um, so trizepatide or Mongerno, I believe that we're going to see improves uh, insulin sensitivity in skeletal muscle. Hmm. Which should, which also, which should be muscle preserving. Yes. Okay. So I think that um, the information out there right now is that they just haven't looked at skeletal muscle. I think that it is a benefit. I think that eventually they are going to use it in very low doses as a prevention and not as a treatment for obesity or type two diabetes. Wow. So mm. as, a, as, as a trainer, I just, I, this, this is, I could guarantee this would happen. You take the average person who doesn't exercise, just have them eat less. They're going to lose muscle too. That's just how the body metabolically adapts. But I'd rather have up. them lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the burden on society, the burden on their family, the burden on the healthcare system, if they are overweight yeah. and obese and cannot regulate food intake. Right. Right. But what I'm saying is you have them strength train and, you know, monitor the protein intake and you offset that. Yeah, and not only do you offset it, they probably build muscle. Yeah. And I can't speak to this too intelligently, but I was looking at um, uh, GLP and GIP and I believe that they increase during exercise. They do. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so Dr. Seed told us at, that. Mm -hmm. He was an expert on that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. There's reports of people 
Smoking less, drinking less. That was what I was going to ask. That's I see that all the time. That's what's fascinating to Wait, me. Wait, what do you mean you see that all the time? I see it all the time. So we prescribe these medications in, in my practice. So what happens? Uh, hmm. I just, these, re- I, I believe it's like a reward pathway. I, I don't know exactly hmm. why it's working, but what we see is that those that have binge eating disorder or have any kind of addiction, it really seems to mitigate. Across the board. Across the board. doesn't matter what it is. That That's is wild. so weird. That's so wild. There was something about the inflammation in the brain. Yes. Uh, too. Yes. Yeah, it affects, lowers. there are these receptors in the brain. Yeah. Yes. And so that contributing to making better decisions as well, like when you're in a better uh, state mentally. And I'm going to go out on a limb by saying this, and part of me in my mind is saying, oh, don't say this, but that then I should, should definitely yeah. say it, yeah. <laughs> is that I think that um, when we think about optimization, what we're going to see is probably a combination of not um, the GLP-1 agonist, but the trizepatide, the dual agonist with hormone replacement. Yeah. Hmm. People are going to feel amazing. Yeah, oh, I bet. And again, we operate in this environment that is unnatural. When I, what I'm not saying that we're in an unnatural environment like we are living in the sticks. You know, my dad lives in Ecuador, the jungle, whatever. I'm not talking about that. Um, I'm talking about an environment where we have constant stimulation, mm-hmm. constant phones, constant food and our drinks and our Celsius, like all this stuff. Um, I think that the component of the trizepatide actually will help I don't know if it's like refocus, but it definitely eliminates the noise of the wanting. Which in a world where, let's just talk about food for a second. Yeah. Like on my phone right now in 10 minutes, I could have whatever the hell I want, whatever flavor or food experience I want. That's right. Brought in here right now while we're podcasting. So the only thing you can't get is a great hotel. And <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so what you're saying is a GLP. I know because what, I love. So yeah. what you're saying is a GLP one agonist could totally help Justin with his Pokemon obsession. <laughs> yeah. I, the you gotta, the you trizepatide. It's the, it's the dual <laughs> agonist that I think is really the winner here. The trizepatide. It's going to increase. What well, here's what they're going to find. We know that it increases. Um, you know, fat and weight loss, but I think they're going to find positive effects on skeletal muscle. Wow. And the thing is, is here's the the crazy things, a crazy thing about humans is when they hear repetition over time, they believe it to be true. Right. Yeah. So in the social media space is you're hearing, oh my gosh, these, and again, I, I'm going back and forth from a GLP versus a, a dual agonist, a GIP, but we're hearing over and over again about how some uh, semaglutide is bad. And these yeah. GLP-1 agonists are bad, and these incretin hormones are bad. Doesn't mean it's true. No, but that's what we're hearing. You know what's funny? You know what we're you know what we're seeing right now. I've, we've we've talked about this on the show. I'm going to keep saying it too, because so, so that people can say, "Oh, Mind Pump said this." Yeah, uh, we are going to we are in the propaganda war, and what you have now for the first time, which you've never had before, they actually work together forever, is big pharma and big food. Usually big pharma works with big food and they would love a drug that lets you eat more garbage and lose weight. But instead they found a drug or substance or peptide that makes you eat less. So now big food's like, oops, let's do the propaganda. War. So I'm seeing articles where it's like, whoa, this is weird. Like I didn't never saw, never thought I'd so see wait, this. So what kind of thing are you seeing? Oh, uh, they're meeting together. That, that was the big one. Like you have these uh, heads of these companies, they're sitting down, they're saying, holy cow, people are going to eat less of our products. How do we maneuver and position ourselves? You yeah, also see imagine the billions of dollars that are going to be lost if people just say, Why don't you snack less? foods and yeah. like the Nestle's and the people oh, that like this is. and and uh, you know twenty <clears> percent <throat> or what ten percent of the population eats ten percent less snack food. That's billions. You also of dollars that companies are going to lose. And also, we just saw this recently. Peptides you could get them from a compound pharmacy. Doctor can you yeah. know, and you're fine. All of a sudden. Yeah, FDA is like, yeah. hey, we got to make, we got to yep. stop doing this, everybody. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's, I 100% think it's a GLP-1 agonist because they're blockbusters. And if you get it from a compound, so semaglutide is the generic name for the peptide. Uh, we go yes. v or Ozempic yes. is the pers- is the yes. brand name one. They're the exact same That's compound. Right. One is expensive and bought from big pharma. Another one's made it a compounding pharmacy. Of course, they're going to want to shut those down. So uh, yeah, they're actually they're. They've tried to shut down a lot of uh, just the peptides in general, um, which is interesting. And again, is it because, you know, as a physician, I think about it from, you know, kind of two perspectives. I wouldn't want to give anything to anybody that I didn't know was done correctly. Sure. Um, was, you know, was it done in a sterile environment? And there are definitely certain regulations from big pharma. Mm-hmm. Compounding pharmacies that are private, um, I, they have different regulations from what I believe and, and 
there's all there's just a lot more variability. Okay. That being said, the overarching question is, should these things be available at a lower cost? Yeah. I mean, that's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Do you work with other peptides too besides those? Oh, yeah. We work with a ton. What are your favorites? Um, it B- depends. I mean, like BPC-157, whether that seems it's to be oral. Like one of the best. But it's been yeah. around for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether it is oral or injectable, depending on what the need is, we see a lot for... Um, if an individual, ha- like, for example, has come back from overseas and has had a lot of GI distress, which uh, we see a lot of infection, um, whether it's parasitic infection, et cetera, uh, gastritis, whatever, uh, the oral BPC seems to work wonders. Obviously, you have to address and identify the pathogen, mm-hmm. but once that is treated, it can be very helpful. And then, uh, again, BPC-157, from an injectable standpoint, depending if an individual is a responder or not. I had uh, mood improvements from BPC injectable. Oh, how weird is that? Yeah. I just felt really good. I still take it every day. I also take it now with thymus and beta, which uh, I just started that. So I'll let you know what the verdict Great. is on that. Yeah. So it's is a very that, interesting space. Is that the most exciting thing right now that we're seeing in medicine in general right now is like the, 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 I mean, uh, availability of these peptides <clears throat> I mean, that you think is most exciting. They've been around for a long time. I think what's most exciting is the trizepatide and, and kind of the, I think that that's really exciting. Yeah. The mm. trizepatide because that's newer now available. Um, what was, so you, what was the name of, uh, what Dr. Khan was saying they're doing now where you could like inject something and then it works almost like a, like you only have to do it one time. And oh, then, well, that's, uh, that's the wrong that's thing. That's the, the fulvastatin. Yeah. yeah fulvastatin. The fulvastatin. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Dr. Yeah. Khan. Uh, yeah, He's yeah. friends with Jordan Shallow. Who yes. Yes. Love. Yep. Oh, I love that guy. One of yes. my favorite people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I know exactly. Um, they've encased gene therapy. It. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They've encased it in like an E. coli yeah. Yeah, carrier. And then, do you see st- uh, stem cell being more accessible, like in terms of treatments for I that do. for your average person? But it's what interesting because these things that they're talking about now, we've used them for a long time. Yeah. Um, the providers that I know, they've been doing all this stuff for a really long time. So it's not necessarily new. Is it just for becoming us. more accessible? I think so. Yeah. It was, it yeah. Wasn't legal, right? Like. The- yeah, I don't. I mean, right now, I still hear people mm-hmm. going to Costa Rica to do it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Go um, to to go back to muscle. Yeah, earlier, you were talking about ultrasound yes. machine specific. Yes. So is, do you use the same ultrasound or is it a specific ultrasound? What are you looking so at? So it's a, the programming. So basically what we're talking about is what are ways to look at skeletal muscle health um, that can be utilized by a provider. Mm-hmm. So right now, um, depending on the provider, you can use ultrasound and look at thickness and you know, muscle aspects of muscle health. But I think that, you know, so we are going to be opening up a brick and mortar clinic. I know everyone's going to cringe. Uh, in uh, Long Island, uh, Colleen Johnson, my head PA, hi, Colleen, mm-hmm. um, is going to really be heading off that initiative. And what we're going to be starting to do is working to collect data on looking at, it's called muscle sound. So we're going to be looking at skeletal muscle under ultrasound and it will be able to tell us it's it's basically what they use right now in the ICU to to look at um, nutrition status, whether it's sarcopenia or cachexia. Oh, okay. But it'll be able to show how much muscle glycogen. What? Uh, yeah, you can tell how much muscle glycogen. Yeah. So this is so non-invasive. Is it like the like the one you exactly. get where you just put exactly. a little gel and yep. wow? And I I do think again, but we all know that the skill of the ultrasound, uh, the person doing the ultrasound varies. But that is where uh, things are going. So in my ideal world, what we're going to look at is we're going to have ultrasound where we're looking at skeletal muscle health. We are using a deuterated creatine to see how much muscle and we will still use DEXA for body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. Not for the lean body mass. Do you, do you, what muscle do you typically, I mean, is it standardized? Is it always the same muscle? Is it the vastus lateralis or like what muscle are you typically looking at with this? Well, I mean, we haven't implemented it yet because this is, um, this is newer tech. I mean, is it newer technology? It's been around for a while, but just for um, the way in which we would utilize it, I, I think that the biceps are always frequently done. Um, but then again, vastus lateralis. Yeah, as just well. close we'll to the see. surface. Yeah. I'd we'll be see. so curious with this long-term uh, data. Like, is there yeah. any is there any let studies? You know. Yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. let me know. Yeah, for sure. It, it, two, in terms of like. Uh, 
the aging process yes. and like over time, like where it, say the person doesn't like change a whole lot of their yes. behaviors and um, you can see an actual drop off or like when, if, if it's not really that substantial of a drop off, if they're like consistent, like <clears throat> in terms of them being able to have more muscle potential or, you know, when that, is there anything like that right now? Um, no, but I, I, I think there's another perspective to what you're saying about that's really important is the literature that we look at for muscle protein synthesis is, uh, you know, I think it's incremental the way in which we can detect change over time. So, for example, you know, if we think about aging population and we think about dietary protein and we think about resistance training and how that affects the physiology of muscle protein synthesis. So right now we're talking about the actual fibers, we're talking about the actual tissue, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now we're talking about a physiologic response. So there's the physiology and then kind of the infrastructure. Mm. Um, and I think that the change, uh, we don't have a great way of measuring incremental changes over time. Mm. And yeah, because we could just look at, okay, muscle protein synthesis means we're synthesizing protein. Right. Yeah. But the, you can't, you're not right now looking at a muscle, you gained mm -hmm. point right. one exactly. gram. I, I think that actual. it's going to be, I think that the, there are challenges um, with those types of things. So if we think about muscle health as a whole, we think about the, the strength aspect, mm -hmm. the strength mobility, which is all the stuff you guys do phenomenally well, which I do think should be included in a general assessment of any human being. Yeah. Um, a patient comes to the office, we know how much they squat, we know how much they deadlift, we know how fast they can run a mile, like all of these things. I think that that would be incredible if that was the standard mm -hmm. of care. Mm -hmm. So that's the um, the capacity, right? Like what is the capacity of the tissue? And then the muscle protein synthetic response, the actual incorporation of amino acids, uh, you know, how does that look? We don't really, I, I think that the changes over time are, it, they're probably pretty subtle mm -hmm. and and challenging to look at. And then the imaging aspect mm -hmm. of what does that tissue look like? And that's kind of how I, I think about that. And then, of course, you add in the blood work. What is the um, level of glucose after a meal that the disposal is happening? How much can the skeletal muscle dispose of glucose? So there's a, you know, kind of the whole picture. So just to sum it up, what I'm saying is, the strength, the the actual performance of the tissue, the um, what the tissue looks like under ultrasound or mm. MRI or CT, which we're not going to do, uh, obviously, CT because that's too much radiation. And then how is it responding to the influence of meals? Mm -hmm. What is the health of that tissue? Very yeah, cool. So Such valuable that's data. Kind of what I, yeah. I, I want to go all the way back to where we were when we we're talking about the archetypes of your patients because I'm I'm fascinated in that because I think there's a lot of parallels in what you do with what we do. Tell him why he's awesome. Is what he's <laughs> no, that's not what I'm searching for. <laughs> and also in my book, I have a training archetype. I bet you guys have seen this. Okay. What? See, I, oh yeah. See, so I'm not, I'm so, this is so interesting to me, and I'm also like. Um, and again, because we have trainers that we're talking to and we have here today, I'm always looking for like, you know, tactical things that I can take away that I can give these people. So when you think of those archetypes you were describing to me, um, what are some generic uh, or general things or tips that you've learned? Like you give that art. Like, okay. Let me, let me give you the training archetype. Okay, so yeah. I cover this in my book. Okay. So in my book, and by the way, I talk about Don Saladino, who we know. Hey, Don, yeah, love you. Love, love um, so there's a, a couple training archetypes. So the really successful CEO is going to be a performer. Meaning, well, I mean, depends because like I, I think about Bedros Koulian and he can get the job done no matter where, where he is. But um, some CEOs or the archetype is the performer that you put them to train by themselves, they're going to be a shit show. Like it's never going to go well. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> mm. they're not going to do it. They'll, they've got the time scheduled, but they're going to be training solo. No one's around and you're telling, okay, go do it's Monday. It's bench day. Do this. They're not going to have a great training session mm. because this group of individuals, the performer will always do better being witnessed. Mm. Doesn't mean that they need someone yelling over them. But they need to go into the gym where there's other people around, and that is a performer through and through. Mm, don't so need funny. to talk to them. They don't. You don't want. They don't want you to talk to them. They don't want you to recognize them. But, but they, they need be you stage. around because they are yeah. so competitive <laughs> that they need to be witnessed. 
Fuck so, off, dude. <laughs> <laughs> fucking subtle they, stuff. They are so <laughs> competitive. Yeah, why you like that's you. I, this is so interesting to me, though, because if you go way <laughs> back like to right old now. conversations <laughs> we've had on here, yeah. shut up. We've had, one Scorpio. of the biggest debates we used to have was like yeah. training at home or training yep. at that. And I'm like, I have this, like, I don't know what it is, but going to the gym. It's a performer. That's and also the gym can't be empty. Yeah, oh, like, of course. There not. has yeah, to be yeah. people. Yeah. Whether that's why I suck in this gym, but I need to go to like a gym gym. So that is a performer through and through, right? Like- they need to Mirrors be witnessed. Yeah. Do not talk to them. But the busier the gym, they'll per- turn on the music. The more distraction in the gym, the better they're going to do. That's okay. So wild. okay. The yeah. better they're going to do. <laughs> you know, know this like person. Yeah. If you are a coach and you are trying to get your really successful patient and they're going to tell you like they don't have time, you tell them, okay, really? How did, how was it the last time you trained in your home gym? Mm. And so you get on them and they've got to go to a, a gym. Mm-hmm. Okay. The busier the gym, the better. The, they will turn it on. Awesome. The solo, there's a, a solo, the, the solo artist or whatever. Those guys, don't fucking talk to them. They'll get it done no matter what. Like they're going to train at home. It doesn't matter. Give them, they'll play the music super loud, so have a do. full playground. Yeah, I bet you it's Sal, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> full playground, turn on the music, don't disturb them. They'll get it done. Yeah, They love it. And then there's like the chameleon where basically they don't they don't care if it's internal, external motivation, they don't care where they are. They'll 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 do it. You guys want to do a Zumba class? They got it. It's fun. That's they'll me. they'll they'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> they'll show up anytime, anywhere. You, you, yeah, they'll show up anytime, anywhere. Right when they, she said they Zumba will too. totally yeah. train. Anytime, <laughs> no, anywhere, they, in, they will show up to train. That's so important. Important. You name it, they don't even have to be good at it, but you know, they kind of are like yeah, let's go. This they're, is so. This very, is such uh, good information, though, for oh, coaches you know and trainers yeah, yeah. because I mean, yeah. th- that's when you're trying to hold somebody accountable or motivate them or guide them through their health and fitness journey, and you're you're constantly telling, "Oh yeah, it's okay, you can train at home," but yet they've never proven themselves they can continue. I would, do I that. would much rather. I, I work out anywhere, but I would much rather work out by myself. With yeah, no one else around. So, yeah. And yeah. so that's the time for you where you're thinking about things, where yep. you're processing things, yep. getting out your anger, whatever it is. That's your time. Yeah. That's when I cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's real yeah. therapy. Yeah. Iron yeah, therapy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So well, this good. is always awesome. How's your book sales going? You, you're on a bestseller list. You're destroying it. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. Uh, I just Times, found out yesterday bro. I actually hit the list in Canada. Wow. So nice. number six in Canada. It's in 11 this morning. Vietnam just bought it. Yes. So it's in 11 countries now. Wow. Thank um, you for doing this. Cause we were talking earlier and we were talking about your, I don't you know, why there's this misconception around strength training. I don't think this was on air, you know, how it, like why, why people view strength training this way, especially women, whatever. And I was talking about pop culture and the history of it. You know, in, in there was a running revolution that started in the late seventies because of a book. It was combined of course, with a popular movie that was the, the complete book of running hit the shelves right around the time Rocky came out and everybody started running. Mm -hmm. I think that you are really helping the next revolution, which is going to be around strength training, around building muscle. I really do. And under muscled and, and, and gyms are changing. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, big box gyms, when they're building them are changing their footprints. They're taking space away from cardio and group classes and and moving it towards weights. So we That's may be incredible. at the very beginning of this new, very positive trend that will finally yeah. have a massive impact or enough of an impact to reverse this terrible trend that we've been on. So, and I want to thank you for being a big part yeah, of that because a huge part of that. We sure. need you need a medical professional to you know because I'm just a trainer, right? And, and a strong female voice. There, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I yes. feel like that. I mean, I, that's what people always ask from us. Yeah. Oh, you guys need another. You need a woman here to come in and say this. Yeah, we'll you just keep bringing you back. Yeah, <laughs> we almost made Justin transition because we're like, yeah. this will help us. <laughs> thought the about it. He was up for it. He actually was. He'd be hot for it. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate what you're doing, and just keep just. Keep doing it. You're you're helping so many people, Dr. Lyon. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And your guys' support means the world. So yeah. thanks. You got it. You.